I'm on, right? Ooh. Are we ready? <laughs> talk, talk, talk. Okay, women. Welcome. If you could prepare that, um, Mike, Luke chapter 3, verse 15. I don't know if she got those in. Hey, ladies. Wow, this looks wonderful. Thank you all for coming. You're giving up your Saturday. So I think all of you realize we have T-shirts in the back. If you didn't get a T-shirt, please get a T-shirt. If you uh, didn't get a t-shirt, Suzanne will be happy to make you another one, <laughs> make you one sure, right? Yes. Pick up another time. Yes. Thank you, Suzanne. Thank you, Sarah, for all the hard work that you put into doing this, for making the t-shirt. So uh, a little rundown of what to expect today. I want you to listen for a word that you're going to hear a little bit. We're going to have some worship and praise. We have a couple of us speaking, and we have Brenda back here. Um, that lives between here and in Enola. I found that much out. That's going to be our special guest speaker today. We welcome her and her friend today. Thank you guys for coming. Uh, we're going to go get downstairs and have a wonderful meal prepared by Sarah and Eric. Woo -hoo -hoo! Healthy food that nourishes our body, right? And um, then we're going to have some fellowship and some socialization time. I think Brenda will be speaking to us again. There is uh, no charge, no cost. All of this is just because we love to get together and we're women, right? Uh, there will be a free will donation box in the back. Uh, so don't feel obligated. We're just so happy you're here. Because to bring something to the service that is dynamic, that's fun, and spirit-filled is what we're all striving to do with our own unique talents and our own unique approaches. Yeah. Now, people that know me know that I usually bring a lot of stuff with me, right? And they just kind of expect <laughs> that I'm going to bring a lot of stuff with me. Where's my crown? Yeah. I got one last year. You yeah. did. <laughs> You never know. The night day's not over. Thank you, Jesus. Does that make you uncomfortable sometimes when Nathan puts the scripture up here and he stands here? I get a little uncomfortable thinking, did I pull up the wrong scripture? You know, what's, what's the problem here? Is this a wrong version? 400 years of silence. It's called the silent years. From the book of Malachi to the book of Matthew. No prophets, no prophetesses. No messages from God were given. How do you think that made the people feel? They had experienced the miracles of God. We now understand that the grace of God was uh, abundant mm -hmm. in that period of time as well. True? They felt like God had forgotten them. They felt like he had forgotten their promises. Go ahead and put that passage of scripture up. It was during this period of silence that we see people in expectation. I keep saying the word expect if you haven't picked up that word yet. Now as the people were in expectation and all reason in their hearts about John whether he was the Christ. Well I don't know about you but to come at a time after 400 years and being in a spirit of expectation is kind of like being on your tiptoes. What's the Lord going to do today? That's what I'm asking. What is the Lord going to do today? What are we expecting him to do today? Well, I get so many ideas when I go into people's homes to clean. My first thing, I told Suzanne, I don't think I can talk because, and I started sharing all these ideas I had with her. And it's like, and I don't know where I'm going with any of them. Well, every house I go to, my poor Shan, my poor Tracy's like, Mom, I come out, I'm like, I got another idea while I was 
She's heard so many sermons. Mike was praying for her last night, and I thought, he has no idea how many sermons this girl has heard the past two months. Because every house we go to, it's like, I got another idea. My idea today is I was watching, I wasn't watching, I was cleaning. They were watching the show, The Price is Right. Well, the best part of The Price is Right is, and Sarah Underbird, come on down. here, so we had to add that in. Plus, I had to add my little wrap. Woohoo! All right, two left. All right, Leah, bid on this one. Two twenty-five. Two twenty-five. On that one? Nope. Two twenty-six. We are sorry. No. So you get this one. No, she did the oh, 325, 326. You get that one. All right, we'll open them up anyhow. <laughs> we have to move faster. I'm, I'm too slow. Oh, and Pete. All right. Thank you, ladies. <laughs> Today, I'm telling you what, whew, I don't know if you guys saw my little my granddaughter last night, but this is how she walks. She walks on her tiptoes. Did you guys see that last night? She runs on her tiptoes. I'm telling you what, when Mike sets the atmosphere, I feel like he's on his tiptoes almost every Sunday, don't you? God's looking for people with expectation. He's expecting him to pour out his spirit. We're expecting him to do the impossible, expecting him to see the dead raised, all the stuff Nathan keeps talking about. Expecting pain to be gone, expecting cancer to be gone, right? Expecting that 
addictions are going to be gone, yes. that the doors of opportunities are opening up every day for us, Amen. the opportunities to witness yes. to people, the opportunity for financial breakthrough, uh, for success, yes. expecting greatness, sowing an expectation, praying an expectation. I tell you what, it's tiptoe time today, right? Yes. You know why? Let's see if I can do this. Many of us have had bears in our life, and we've already slain them. We've killed the lions. But today, I'm telling you what, it's time to pick up your rock, and pick up your stone, and pick up your sling. Careful. <laughs> I'm not good at this. Hey, don't worry. It's not going far. You get the idea. It's time to pick up the giants in our life and to defeat the giants of self-doubt, of so low self-esteem, of depression, the giant of anxiety, the giant of broken-heartedness, broken dreams, the giant of bitterness, the giant of anger. You name your giant. But you know what? After he defeated that giant, he didn't just leave that giant laying there. He came back and he beheaded that giant. He detached. It's time to detach. Yes. It's time to get on our tiptoes. Yes. There's other people in the Bible that had great expectations. There was a lame man that came, and every day he says he came to the temple, and there was Peter and John, and here yes. they come. Now, he didn't, where's my hope? hope. He didn't hope. hope he didn't think. You need it? Nope, I just need you to hold it up. <laughs> he didn't believe. You got believed too, don't you? There was a reason that I had all these and everything came all together here. Suzanne, thanks for letting me open. <laughs> this is not even my speech yet. Okay. <laughs> I tell you what. Yeah, he didn't think or hope or believe, but he came with expectations that they're going to give him some change, right? But they came with the expectation of silver and gold have I none, but such as I have give I thee. Right? They came with great expectations. Zacchaeus. You can put them down. Thank you. Zacchaeus came. He went up and climbed up a tree. Why did he do that? He had expectations to look for Jesus, didn't he? Amen. He did. So, I'm out of breath already. <laughs> it's with expectation that we all come today. We're expecting to slay giants. We're expecting to detach ourselves yes. from those things that have helped us bondage yes. mm -hmm. and to help other people understand how they also can. Yes. See, the devil isn't afraid of our past. He's afraid of what we haven't yes. done yet, yes. what we haven't conquered yet. The greatest miracles, as Nathan says, I mean, this is what he's been telling us. Just, I always do it in a different way, same message. So I'm saying, look with assurance. That's what expectation means, assurance anticipation because the best is yet to come so whether you're on your tiptoes as we worship the Lord whether you are or whether you're not remember this the Lord loves you yes. lavishly yes. he's not as stingy strings attached but a love that stretches beyond the stars yes. the hot, far into eternity and he wants to sweep you up in his yes. arms yes. he wants to scoop you up yes. and he wants to softly say you're mine I approve of you. I love you when you're afraid, when you're frazzled. I delight in the way you flavor the world. I talked about that last time, being the light. He delights in the way we light up the world. I love the way you thirst for me. I love your humbleness. Matter of fact, you're a star. I love your quirks. Even your quirkiest quirks. Yeah. I guess this is my quirkiest quirks. <laughs> you should say how much fun I have with my grandbabies. <laughs> we have a zoo out on our porch. I mean, uh, I love the way you trust me. I love your imagination. I love the way you trust me. I love the way you follow me. Worship team, please come. Right now, I love the way you're going to praise me. And let's do this with expectation. Whether you're sitting down and you're on your tiptoes or you're standing up and you're on your tiptoes. Let's go and worship the Lord and expect nothing but the best. And what we get received today, we're taking out to the world. In Jesus' name.
I'm just so thankful, God, that you have called us all here today. Lord, we know it's not by accident that each one of these ladies are in this room. We know, God, that there is a hunger and a longing in us, Jesus, that keeps us <coughs> expecting things, God, that your word tells us is true. We just thank you, God, right now, Lord. We thank you for all the unspoken things in our hearts, Lord, that we already know and see accomplished because you are in us. It can't be anything else but accomplished because you are in us. Thank you, God, for that reality, Lord. Thank you, Lord, that you have blessed all these speakers today, God. Be with us as we continue through this, Lord. We will give you all praise, glory, and honor in the name of Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, God. Thank you, worship team. That was beautiful. Mm -hmm. Yay. So again, thank you all for being here. Can you hear me? Am, am I on? Can you hear me? Okay. Okay. Yeah. Um, last time I spoke at the last women's conference, which was in the spring, I kind of gave a background of, of me and when I was saved. And I'm going to do that again because there's new faces.
pieces in the room, but <clears throat> at age 13, I was saved. And I'll always be thankful for that man that came down in the middle of a slumber party that I was attending. And it was her dad, and, she, and he sat there with all of us. There were probably five women, or five girls in the room. And he was bold enough to ask us all, have, do we know Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior? And at the time, I really didn't know about it. Um, I was raised Catholic, so I didn't really know what a relationship was. So at that moment, all five of us gave our lives over to Christ. And since then, <clears throat> move on. Five years down the road, I got married at a young age and still married to the same man, but my walk hasn't always been like I thought it would be. I thought, okay, Christ now is, is in my life leading me. My marriage has been challenged on different occasions. My health has been challenged. My financial area, my finances have been challenged. And I just thank God for what he has revealed to me in this day. I can't remember how long ago uh, Toby and I have started attending this church, but Nathan um, took it over. I don't know, Sally, what year it was, maybe. Um, long time. <laughs> and he... Um, he was honest enough to say, the Lord told me, if I didn't open this Bible up and read it in a different light, not that it's different, but in a different light, there's a lot of uh, things that we have taken out of context that has maybe set us back, maybe. But he started preaching the grace of God and that all things have already been accomplished because of Jesus Christ at the cross. So that's kind of where my, um, what I'm going to share with you today is uh, in lines with. And it may not seem like it's geared around women, <laughs> but um, God created mankind. So he hasn't moved me from what I have wrote down here, so I believe it's somebody in the room has to hear this. So he actually gave me this mes message maybe a month ago, and I kept thinking, oh, Nathan asked me to preach. I'll get up and preach this message, but um, uh, Suzanne asked me to talk again today, so I believe it's for today. So, so God's message, message to me was this. Do you realize he wants you in complete surrender to him? He wants us to completely surrender to the ministry of grace because therein lies the power. I feel like sometimes we as humans try to help God we feel like we have to have our hand in it. <clears throat> Do things to help him. When in all reality, he wants you to surrender and be in a peaceful state. The message I'm going to share today revolves around this surrender. But first, the Spirit wanted me to look up what each evangelist, how each evangelist viewed Christ and his entrance into the world. And what each evangelist symbolizes. I believe he wanted me to do this because even though... We may have different points of view, and we are on our individual walk with him. His ultimate plan for all of us is that he wants he and I to be one. He wants us to be one with him. He wants to be our savior, our father. Our, he's our creator. So God with us, so we are one. So Matthew. Matthew is symbolized by a winged man or an angel. His gospel starts with Joseph's genealogy from Abraham. Matthew's gospel represents Jesus's incarnation and so Christ's human nature. This signifies that Christians should use their reason for salvation. Matthew viewed Jesus as compassion and forgiveness. In Matthew 1.21, it explains, And she shall bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. So Matthew viewed Jesus as his, a savior. Matthew 1.23 says, And they shall call his name Emmanuel, which being interpreted is God with us. So, God with us. 
In Mark, Mark is symbolized by a winged lion, a figure of courage and monarchy. The lion also represents Jesus' resurrection because lions were believed to sleep with eyes open, a comparison with Christ in the tomb. And Christ is king. Mark's gospel signifies that Christians should be courageous on the path of salvation. Mark viewed Jesus as a man of action. So in Mark 1.8 it reads, I indeed have baptized you with water, but he shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost. So God with us. Mark 1.11 says, And there came a voice from heaven saying, Thou art my son, in whom I am well pleased. So Mark viewed him as sonship, father. In Luke, Luke symbolize, is symbolized by a winged ox or a bull, or bull, a figure of sacrifice, service, and strength. Luke's account begins with the duties of Zacharias in the temple. It represents Jesus' sacrifice and his passion and crucifixion, as well as Christ being high priest. The ox signifies that Christians should be prepared to sacrifice themselves in following Christ. Luke viewed Jesus as fate and free will. So in Luke 1.32, he describes Jesus as, He shall be great and shall be called the Son of the Highest, and the Lord God shall give him the throne of his father, David. So sonship. Luke 1.33, And he shall reign over the house of Jacob forever, and his kingdom there shall be no end. So a Savior. And we get to John. John is symbolized by an eagle, a figure of the sky and believed by Christian scholars to be able to look straight into the sun. John starts with an eternal overview of Jesus and goes on to describe many things with a higher Christology than the other three Gospels. John's Gospel represents Jesus' ascension and Christ's divine nature. This symbolizes that Christians should look on eternity without flinching as they journey towards their goal of union with God. John viewed Jesus as the divine incarnation of God. In John 1, 9, he describes Jesus as the true light which lighteth every man that cometh into the world. John 1, 12 says, To as many as received him, to them gave he power to become, the, to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. John 1, 14 says, And the word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory that that glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. So from Matthew to John, we hear some of the same points of view of who Jesus is, a Savior, a Father. He's God with us. However, when we get to John, the symbolic of the eagle, he uses words like true light, power, full of grace and truth. So being full of something means this, Containing or holding as much or as many as possible, having no space, no empty space. So Jesus had no empty space because it was filled with grace and truth. And the word was made flesh and dwelt among us. When Jesus walked the earth, he had one mission. And we, being his children, should have the same mission. Here's what that mission is in John 4, 34. Jesus said unto them, my meat is to do the will of him that sent me. And to finish his work. Our mission in this life is not to live out our agenda. Instead, we need to live out the will of the one who sent us. Yeah. Say what we hear the Father say. Jesus' ministry was full of compassion, declaration, and truth. He said in John 4:14, 4, Whosoever drinketh of the water that I shall give him shall never thirst. But the water that I shall give him shall be in him, a well of water springing up into everlasting life. God's love for humanity is so profound. He used Jesus to speak to those who were hurting, those broken body, those abandoned, to give them hope. Yes. To give them a chance to drink from the water of everlasting life. Over and over while Jesus walked the earth, he was asking people to lay down their life and follow him completely surrender to their own way of thinking, viewing, and assessing their flesh, and just trust Him. He said in John 5.20, For the Father loveth the Son, and showeth Him all things that Himself doeth, and He will show Him greater works, and these that ye may marvel. So God wants to show us in this time the greater works, but we have to surrender 
and let him show us those greater things. We always marvel at the fact, or at least I do, that Moses was there when God split the sea. I mean, my, math, no, my natural mind can't even conceive of it. So you walk up, staff down, because God's telling you, and this vast sea rolls back, and they walk through on dry ground. Or when Peter walked on water, yep, he stepped right out of a boat, and he walked on water. This seems easy, right? But to step out of that boat,
walk on water, I can say amen, or I can say yes, I believe, but actually walking on water. Again, our minds in this day would tell, my mind in this day would tell me otherwise. Or how about Daniel? Thrown into a lion's den, and not one lion opened its mouth to touch him. Then there was Jonah, who actually lived in the belly of a great fish for three days. He breathed, he lived in that belly, and after three days, the fish spit him out on dry land. Now, do we believe in this room? If we were swallowed by a whale, God would keep us breathing. You know what I'm saying? It's like we have got to get to this place where we are in complete surrender and trusting him to move us through different things of our lives. Or how about the three that were thrown into the fiery furnace? It's recorded that the people that, there were, that were there couldn't even walk up to that furnace or they'd be burnt up. But these three came out without a mark on their clothes. And my favorite while of the Bible, when Ezekiel came up onto the valley of dry bones, in chapter 37, <laughs> sorry, I'm just thinking, man, we got to get here. We got to get to where we completely trust in these things, not worry about our life's challenges. In chapter 37 of Ezekiel, the Spirit of the Lord asked him, Son of man, can these bones live? And, he, and Ezekiel answered saying, Oh Lord God, you know. And God told him to prophesy to the bones. Once Ezekiel opened his mouth and commanded the bones to live, they lived. Bones came together, bone to its bone, sinews, muscles, tendons on the bones, and flesh grew, and the skin covered them. Then Ezekiel prophesied to the breath, and breath came into them, and the bones came to life and stood on their feet, exceeding great army. I mean, I mean, wow. <laughs> A bunch of bones. And those people in those times only had the Spirit hovering them. As Jesus said in John 5, 20, greater works will we do in his name that we may marvel. And all those, all those people that I mentioned, they had to go through a, uh, a second or whatever you want to say of a surrender to God to say, yes, I believe. To me, that is a surrender, an example of surrender. We now have the spirit living in us. The very same spirit that made those dry bones live lives in us. God wants to show us great and mighty things in this time so the world will know him and his power. He wants us to have complete trust in him and his unconditional love for us. That he will do greater things through us than what he even did through those people yes. that have gone before us. The spirit that we've kept under our skin, so to speak, is longing to work miracles through us. He's longing for a complete surrender of your flesh and for you to take him by his hand so he can lead, lead you. He wants you to know that you are the righteousness of God because of Christ. And Christ is in you, the hope of glory. So because Christ is in you, you are the righteousness. Because Christ cannot be anything but righteous. So when you look to Christ, the author, the finisher of our faith, you surrender to self. We need to lock eyes on the Savior at all times, in all situations. We are on a verge, I believe, of a mighty breakthrough. The enemy knows it, and he wants to keep you hiding behind your flesh. You need to constantly declare to him the truth of God. In John 6, 40, it says, And this is the will of him that sent me that everyone which seeth the Son and believeth on him may have everlasting life, and I will raise him up in the last day. God will raise us up in the last day. He is seeking for those who he can raise up in these times. Once the surrender happens, he is then able to work through you. It's like he explained to Ezekiel after the dry bones became an army. The Lord described to Ezekiel that the bones are the whole house of Israel. And that their bones are dried up and their hope is lost. But God brought life to them by telling them he would open their graves and make them come out of their graves, his people. He said he would bring them back home to the land of Israel. Then they will know with confidence that he is Lord. He said he will put his spirit in them and they will 
come to life, and he will place them in their own land. Then they will know what the Lord has spoken and fulfilled it. So the places that we feel have been dry bones. Remember, you have a better revelation than Ezekiel ever knew. God sent Jesus to fill those dry places, but you have to surrender to him and then prophesy or declare to the dry place that it lives. Jesus brings life to it. The great light of the world lives in you if you have him as your savior. So there is nothing impossible because of him. God did not withhold anything from Ezekiel when he was looking at that pile of bones. The Lord simply asked if he believed that they could live. At that moment, Ezekiel surrendered to God and then believed. Once Ezekiel was in agreement and declared, bones became an army. And God is no respecter of people. What he did through one, he will do through anyone that will believe him. Again, he said that we will do greater things in this time. Jesus Christ died on the cross that we might walk in fullness of him. He laid down his life so that you could be empowered to walk in the spirit leaning on the Holy Spirit to lead and guide you. He wants to be glorified through you. How humbling is it to know that the great I Am <laughs> sent His only begotten Son to die a horrific death so that we could have Him indwell inside our being and walk in His power. Not only does He want to indwell in you as your Lord and Savior, but He wants you to walk in the power of His might. The stories that I shared with you regarding Jonah, Daniel, Ezekiel are not just stories. They were real life events that happened through the average man. God worked through these people to bring hope, to inspire us to know that he is for us, to encourage us to fully surrender to the spirit of his son that is in us so that we too step out and do the mighty works. The Bible tells us in John 6:51 that Jesus is the living bread which came down from heaven. If any man eat of this bread, he shall live forever. And the bread that I give is my flesh, which I will give for the life of the world. So earlier in John 4:14, 4, where Jesus was saying that those who seek him will never thirst. So now he's the living bread and the water. He's food and drink consuming us. With him we should not thirst or hunger. He wants us to understand that he consumes our being. We cannot fail if we have him. Stepping out to allow him to work through you is a constant reality that the Holy Spirit wants you in. You are ordained before the foundation of the world. He loves you. He formed you in your mother's womb to live in this time. Because he knew we'd be the people that the true gospel of grace would be preached and we would carry the baton to the finish line. He loves us more than we can even imagine. It's truly an everlasting love. It's not based on human performance, rights and wrongs, but solely by what he did for you by going to the cross. He's in love with us, ladies. He's in love with us. Do you know how the word of God defines love? Apostle John said, in this is love. Not on the back deck, and it was spring and I looked I literally moved my chair to look straight east and I just sat there and I said Lord let's just be done with this just split the eastern sky blow the trumpet and send the cavalry let's just be done with this and that's I truly felt that way and I'll never forget as soon as I said that, Holy Spirit said, you will never leave until you do what you are called to do. And you will never stand before me and use your husband, and then he said another name as your excuse. Now I have a great husband, so don't. But I was in, um, I was hurt, and I won't go into details at all because I don't want to, but I was hurt deeply in a church setting by church leaders and then felt forced to stay in that situation for a long time. And so I'm very sensitive to Holy Spirit and I hear God, but it became uncomfortable staying there and hearing God. And again, my way of dealing with things sometimes is retreating. And I remember saying to the Holy Spirit one day, I said, okay, 
I'm more spiritually mature than my husband is. I'll wait him out. 13 years later, I'm sitting on the back deck of my house, wanting to be done with life. So I was forced, and you know, I didn't really realize it until later, but it was like, because I said to the Lord, I said, okay, then let's get on with it. What am I here for? What am I supposed to do? What was I born for? God puts seeds of greatness in every single person. But what do we see? Do we see those seeds of greatness in each other? And I see, I did see, seeds of greatness in other people easily. But I never saw seeds of greatness in me, because I knew me. I knew everything I'd been through. I saw a failed crop. It's like, how could God ever use me? So that was a day. I felt like you to see that picture of that cat hanging onto the end of the rope. Yeah. <laughs> that, I, that was me at that moment. It was like, okay, I'm hanging on. You got to help me. You got to show me. You got to. And I instantly just, I mean, it was just like an immediate decision. But I realize now the Lord used that as a hook because my motivation was, I still want to be done with this thing. <laughs> I still want to be done with this thing called life because I know it's so much greater with you. So my motive was, okay, let's, we'll get, let's do it, but only because I want to leave. <laughs> so a couple years after that, and the, so many things happened. I mean, my mom got a brain aneurysm and it ruptured. My foster daughter had brain surgery. She was pregnant and she couldn't have surgery. Uh, mom lived through that. We got her through all of that. And two months to the very day that she moves in with my brother, my brother's killed in a head-on car collision. I mean, it was just one hit after another. And I was like hanging on for dear life. And so in January 2013, is another defining moment. If, all of those weren't, but <laughs> um, I'm driving to, my mom lives in Newton and I had moved away from there, I moved up to the Des Moines area and I'm driving to Newton to see my mom and I was happy. I felt like the weight of the world had been finally lifted off my shoulder for a while and uh, not that we're ever meant to carry it, but um, listening to praise and worship music I wasn't thinking anything like, let's, be, let's just get out of here type of thing, you know? And the Holy Spirit interrupted my worship music and says, don't you realize that if I allowed you to come home now, you would never have the crown to lay at Jesus' feet? And he started speaking to me about our life here on earth is to fulfill what he spoke before the foundations of the world. And the only thing that's going to make it to heaven is the things that he's asked us to do. And the jewels that get put in that crown, that's our reward. That's the prize at the end of the race. And it's not even for us. It's so we don't go empty-handed. It's so we could lay down our life, a, a crown of jewels, resembling our life and lay it down at the feet of Jesus to tell him his blood was not wasted. So my mental of, uh, okay, let's do this because I want to get out of here, changed that day. It was like, okay, I want to leave earth totally empty of absolutely everything that he has asked me to do. And I still didn't know what that was. <laughs> Excuse me a second. <laughs> so fast forward, June 2014. So we're still in this five-year icky season. 
June 2014, the worst crisis to hit my husband and I personally happened. And I had no idea how long it was going to last. Of course, we never want it to last overnight. And seven months into it, I remember sitting in my prayer room. And I said to the Lord, you know, you talked about surrender, total surrender. And that's what happened that day. Because for seven months, I'm sure I was begging God. I was crying. I was you know, telling him how I wanted this to look at the end of all of it, right? And I sat in my prayer room that day and I said, God, I am so done with praying about this. I'm so done of crying. My heart is broken. It's like I am just so done with that. Because at this time I'm 55-ish around there. And I just said, Lord, you have gotten us through so many life-altering crises. Every single one. We're still standing. Yes, amen. Even if we're crawling in the dirt of the mess, we're still yes. standing for Christ. Yes. And I said, you have gotten us through all of this. I said, you've got us. And I said, I want to know what's written in my book. I want to know what you wrote when I was still a spirit inside of you, we live and move and have our being inside of God. We are a living spirit inside of a living God. And there's a day that God says, it's your time. We as little spirits are like, oh, send me, send me. I want to go be a redeemed spirit. And one day God says, okay. So I, don't read, I want to read uh, Psalms 139, 13 through 18. For you created my inner being. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful. Yes. Yes. It's not a failed crop. No. He says we're wonderful. Yes. He purposed for us to be there. Mm. I know that full well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was made in that secret place of the Most High. When I was woven together in the depths of the earth, your eyes saw my unformed body. All the days ordained for me, for you, every day was written in your book before one of them came to be. How precious to me are your thoughts, God. How vast is the sum of them. Where were I to count them, they would outnumber the grains of sand. Think about that. He thinks about you so much that it is more than every grain of sand on this planet. Again, our, we have a hard time getting, it's a spirit thing. We can't understand it up here. It's a spirit thing. For I wake and I am still with you. So I really started pressing in. What's my purpose? What am I here for? There has to be more. You know, and I can list this whole list of stuff of what I'd done and who I was or what I'd, you know, accomplished. And none of them were fulfilling. It's like there has to be more. So I say I had the audacity to ask God. It's like, you know, he's asking, he's waiting for that right question. I always say that. He's always waiting for that right question to answer it. And I had the audacity to ask God, what's on your heart? Who can I help for you? And at that very moment when I asked that, I sensed his presence so strong in my room. And I felt as if he wrapped his arms around me and he engulfed me into his heart. And he took me into the secret chamber of his heart. And he started downloading on me, to me about human trafficking and I truly knew very little. I had heard the term and that was about it. 
and still was thinking prostitution was different. And all of a sudden, I felt his pain. And then I felt their pain. And I started hearing their cries. Nobody cares. Nobody's looking for me. They don't even think I'm worth fighting for. They look right at me, but they don't see me. Will anybody ever come? Will anybody ever help? After I kind of got my breath after that, I heard the Lord say, the fight won't be easy, but it will be worth it. I said, okay. What I didn't tell you earlier was that January, that same month, at the very beginning of the month, that it was at a conference down in Texas, and this gentleman that my husband and I had befriended at the conference, you know how we are, little herds, we go to the same spot all the time. And uh, he said, the Lord has a prophetic word for you. And so he spoke over us and my cell phone was all crackly and there was a lot of noise and I didn't capture it. But one of the things he said was, God is asking if you will partner with him on an amazing journey. And you don't have to know how to do it. You don't have to know any of it. He's already provided it all. And he will, he just asking if you'll partner. And I said yes, and my husband said yes. We had no idea what it was. So we had said our yes, and he used that yes. So that day in my prayer room, after I went through that experience, my heart was broken for what I discovered was my mission field. My heart was broken for young women whose basic rights have been denied them, whose dignity has been stolen, whose voices have been silenced, whose spirits have been crushed, and whose souls have almost ceased to exist. I started to weep for women that I had never met, and I haven't stopped yet. So we talk about evil. Evil's real. We all know evil is real. But I want to tell you courage is real too. Yes, it is. It takes courage to go on living after a sexual abuse. It takes courage to want to live after trauma. It takes courage to hope that things could possibly get better. It takes courage to ask for help. And it takes courage to accept help, usually from total strangers. It takes courage to trust again and to love again. It takes courage to fight and do the hard work that it takes to get your life back. And it takes courage to get your voice back to tell your story. Something I realized, you know, when you're you live in a, a per, so-called protected environment and not exposed to a lot. You just think whatever you lived is normal. Mm -hmm. And uh, in my journey of researching about sex trafficking and the trauma piece of it and what happens, I discovered that People that go through sexual abuse, that kind of trauma, give up their will to live. Mm -hmm. And I didn't realize that that's why, ever since I can remember, I wanted to be with Jesus and I didn't want to be here. I wasn't suicidal. I think, mom, I don't know, preached to us that if you kill yourself, that's murder and you'll die and go to hell. And I didn't want to take that chance. So I would never, you know, would, would do anything. But I always had that secret desire to be gone. And it wasn't until I was researching this that I realized that's where it came from. Because I was inappropriately touched by family members and family friends. 
I had an attempted rape at the age of 13. I was raped at 14 and twice at 15. You think your life isn't worth anything. So I've said yes to the Lord for working with as many of these courageous women as possible, these brave women, very brave women. And remember earlier I said 2% ever find freedom? That number's not good enough. That day I was overwhelmed and the Lord reminded me of the starfish story and I usually have a prop of a little starfish and I'll just share it really fast. Everybody probably knows it, but I, I, he, I was, I mean, it's like, what am I supposed to do? <laughs> I'm a real estate agent, I'm a grandmother, you know, what am I supposed to do? And he reminded me of the starfish story and in a nutshell, this older gentleman would go take a walk on the beach every morning before he would start writing. And the night before a storm came in and filled the beaches full of starfish as far as he could see to the right or the left. And he's walking down the beach and he sees this little girl from a distance and she looks like she's dancing and when he gets close to her, he sees what she's doing. And she's reaching down and she's picking up starfish and throwing them out in the ocean as fast as she could. And he comes up and he says, little girl, what are you doing? And she looked at him like he asked the stupidest question and she's like, well, I'm saving the starfish because the sun's gonna be up and they're all gonna die if they don't get back in the water. And he said, do you really think you're gonna make a difference? There's thousands of starfish. And she reached down and she reminds me of Sarah because with all that energy, she reached down and picked up her starfish and threw it out in the ocean. She, and she, but she looked at it and showed it to him. And she said, for this one, I can make a difference. And she threw it as far as she could. So I think I was hyperventilating probably, which is why he had to remind me of that story. So I went on a learning journey. And during that spring, that's when Garden Gate Ranch was birthed. Every time, I mean, it was constantly on my mind and I pray about that population of people and what I was to do. And I, he was telling me about a residential facility and was giving me all of these things to do. So who is Garden Gate Ranch and what's our mission? Garden Gate Ranch is a non-denominational, Bible-based Christian organization providing assistance, resources, and training for the sexually exploited. Providing a pathway to hope, restoration, empowerment, dignity, and purpose. Garden Gate Ranch was birthed out of a heart of compassion and a stand against biblical and social injustice. Just hearing the silent cries of those that our trap compels us to do whatever it takes to get her off the street and to safety. These young women don't need Garden Gate Ranch just because they're victims of sex trafficking, but she needs a place like Garden Gate Ranch so she can realize that she has more than what happened to her. Because what happened to her does not have to define her life because God's word is what defines her life. What does he say? She's valuable. Yes. She's priceless. Yes. She's loved. And she was born on purpose for a purpose. Yes. She has a future and a hope. Yes. She just needs the space and the time and love from people who will believe in her until she can believe in herself. Amen. So Garden Gate Ranch's mission is to offer her that pathway a pathway to hope, to restoration, tools for empowerment, dignity, and purpose in a safe, faith-filled environment. Our focus at Garden Gate Ranch is not sex trafficking. We will not talk about sex trafficking all the time. She will have to deal with that with her independent counselors and therapy. But our part, and that's just how she gets there, sex, sexual exploitation, Sexual violence is what gets her through that door. But our focus is to help her discover who she really is and what she wants for her life. Why did God at that time take that little spirit and put it in the womb of that woman? What did he speak into that spirit? And we know everything God speaks comes to pass. 
what did he speak in that spirit that he wants her to know? So that's our goal. So we have several phases. Um, phase one and two we are working at very uh, extensively, and then there's a phase three that I see down the road, so we don't really talk a whole lot about it, but I'll mention it briefly. So phase one is the pathway house, and it is a, a shelter safe house for women 18 and over with or without their children, no questions asked. I get a phone call in the month of June, I got phone calls that equivalent 12 young women who needed a place to live, who needed off the streets. And we've had so many phone calls, and before I can hang up the phone, call another safe house, and make arrangements to get to her. A new boyfriend shows up, puts her on a bus, and they're going to Grandpa's house. Really? Probably not. So she's going to enter the doors, no questions asked. We'll start unpacking her life after she gets there. But we want to get her off the street. We don't want to put, leave her out there for another person to take advantage of her. So this program is a 45 to 60 day program. We're going to evaluate where she's at. It's basic shelter, basic needs, uh, clothing, medical attention, and uh, connect her with community resources such as treatment, counseling, job opportunities, and future housing. And also offer her continuing restoration in another facility. I don't like to say long term. I wouldn't want to go to long term. <laughs> so I call it continuing restoration. And again, these are her choices. We have to offer her the, and let her find her voice. So phase two is the ranch house, and that's the continuing restoration. And if our home doesn't appeal to her or isn't what she uh, fits, then we are in communication with we're collaboration with a lot of other homes that we can uh, hopefully find that place for her. Um, and that is as long as she needs it. It could be six months, it could be three months, it could be two years. She will be the one to indicate that. And that one is going to be strictly for women 18 and over that have a child with them, or expecting a child, or they have a children with a family member or maybe the state care in hopes to get their child back. In that program, we have seven pillars to her pathway of restoration. Uh, pillar one is physical needs. That's pretty simple. Uh, the second pillar is medical and psychological. The third is spiritual and emotional slash psychological, because those kind of go hand in hand a lot. And that will, I'll break that down a little bit. That's counseling, personal group and family with a certified licensed counselor, uh, spiritual guidance with Bible studies, uh, therapies, lots of therapies with the licensed therapist uh, for some of these. Um, equine therapy, art therapy, dance, creative writing, journaling, drama, music, culinary, pet, gardening, exercise, sports and fitness, play therapy, EMDR, sewing, jewelry making, candle making, pottery. She needs to be able to have fun. Yeah. And just, you know, when you're busy and you're having fun, you can kind of let go of some stuff and things will come to the surface. And then, of course, they need those professionals that know exactly what they're doing when they're in a counseling session or a therapy session, like the EMDR and the uh, counseling. The fourth pillar is coaching, so that's social formation. We have a certified coach, um, and that's to help develop life skills, parenting skills, financial planning, um, learn healthy boundaries, learn healthy relationships. Um, our fifth pillar is legal services. We will outsource that um, and work with uh, attorneys that will help these young women if they need to go through that. And then our sixth pillar is education, um, GED if they don't have it, vocational training, and helping help her get into like DMACC if that is her desire. And our fifth pillar is social development, and that's with a licensed social worker, and that would be like family education, job training, and social interest. Integration. Can never say that right. <laughs> so anyway, so our location is Central Iowa. It's a rural setting. I can't, you know, we can't really give out the address, even though we don't have the address right now. We do in our hearts and in our heads, but my name's not on it yet. Um, so we know where we're going. We're just waiting for the phone call. I believe it's coming today. Anyway. <laughs> um, 
So what, what we are, what I, I know that God has said, it's going to be a large home. We're going to have outbuildings, space for ministry uh, buildings and staff housing, um, horse barn and arenas inside and out, open spaces, gardens, outdoor activities, timbers for trail rides, walking paths, prayer and reflection paths, and a pond. And before we actually open 24/7, we're gonna our, we're working at now developing a day program that we can help other ministries and help women um, that just maybe want to come in for financial peace or some of those things. So, remember the starfish? Remember the little girl? Let me tell you the rest of that story. Everybody, anybody remember Paul Harvey? I mean, my age, you remember? You probably don't remember. Well, he used to, he was this newscast. He was this news whatever. Uh, and he'd always talk about all of these different things, and then he'd always leave you hanging until the very end of the show, and then he says, now for the rest of the story. So now for the rest of the story. Remember the little girl when she picked up that starfish and she said, for this one, I can make a difference? And she threw it as far as she could into the ocean. Well, the old man looked at the little girl, and he thought about what she had just done, and he was inspired to join her. So he started picking up starfish and throwing them into the ocean. And soon many others joined them and started throwing the starfish into the ocean. And before the sun came up, all of the starfish were saved. So that says we all have a place. We all have a responsibility to help people that are in these kinds of situations. And we all can make a huge difference. And together, we can make an amazing impact for the kingdom of God. And so that's where you all come in to pray about what is your spot, where's your place. And I'd like to leave you with one more thought. So as we gather with our families for holiday dinners, football games, birthday celebrations, or we go on vacation, take a moment to consider the thousands of young women and young men and children that are being sold every single day, rented out in our communities, right in plain sight. I, for one, won't turn my back on them, and I pray you won't either. Let's make a difference. All for the love of one person. Let's make a difference. Thank you. That's all we have for the formal program. Uh, we'll have lunch downstairs. Um, Sarah, uh, who runs the program, Sarah and Eric provide all the food. Um, everything today is just our gift to you. Um, again, all of your monetary gifts will go to Grand Gate Ranch. And afterwards, we're going to have time for crafts and fellowship. Mm -hmm. And I'm doing a little fingering on. Yes.